it seemed, at least to the untrained eye, pretty staggering, the increase in reports that you got in 2021 versus 2020. When you got this data back, looking at the past year, what, what stuck out to you? Well, I think definitely the continued increase, as you noted, in, in the volume. I mean, it's something that we see day by day. We see, um, you know, the, the increase grow over the course of the year. So it, you know, was, was not shocking to us that we ended up so much higher. Um, you know, I, I think a few other things that, that stand out is the continued growth of video that's being reported to us, um, you know, and just the, the, the nature of, of those videos, the extremity of the abuse um, that is inflicted on children, especially when exploitative videos are reported, how different those are in many ways from, from images. And again, continuing to see a growth in videos as opposed to images. I think also a trend that we've seen over the past couple of years, which is a real increase in online enticement of children. Um, sometimes you might hear you know, the term enticement or the term sextortion, but we continue to see a big growth in those reports as well this year. Hmm. Is there any, I know that it's a broad range, but is there anything you attribute this to specifically, such, a, such an increase, this 35% increase in reports over the past year? So we usually look to um, you know, several factors that, that probably ac account for this growth in volume. And, and some of them are positive. We do think that there are more companies that are doing more to detect, report, and remove this content. Um, and we applaud those companies that um, perhaps have just started doing that or are expanding their efforts to actually locate this content, remove it, and, and report it so children aren't abused anymore. But, you know, I, I think also we continue to see globally um, increase in individuals who have access to the internet, um, reduced costs of cloud storage and other very cheap <laughs> online storage um, where people can actually uh, share videos and, and images and, and have large quantities of collections of these images that they keep. And everybody has a smartphone now, right? So everybody has a phone that has a camera. They can shoot video, they can shoot images, they can email them, they can message them. So I, I just think all of that also feeds into the availability um, and the opportunity for offenders um, to engage in this sort of crime against children. Where, where in the process does your organization typically get involved? Is it a tip from just the public? Is it a law enforcement agency reaching out saying, here's what we have so far. Do you have any reports that might concur with this or do you do your own um, investigative work to start the process of, of finding these crimes and rooting them out? Sure. So the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is a nonprofit organization. So we do not do any investigative work. Um, we are the National Clearinghouse on Missing and Exploited Children issues. So as, as part of our responsibilities and our work as the National Clearinghouse, we operate what we call the cyber tip line. And it is simply a reporting mechanism where, um, as you noted, members of the public um, or electronic service providers, which you know, we could also just refer to as social media companies or tech companies, can report apparent instances of child sexual exploitation to us. So we really sit in the middle. We receive those reports. Um, we try to add a little value um, to that information, but mostly we're trying to determine where in the world is this child being harmed? It might be in the US, it might be in any other country around the world. And our goal there is to make sure that we can then push that report and make it available to law enforcement in the appropriate jurisdiction so that they can handle the review and potential investigation of that crime. Is that just a simple handoff or do you help at all in the process moving forward once law enforcement gets involved? Once law enforcement receives the reports, we, um, we often refer to it as really a door shuts on our process. At that point, it is in the hands of law enforcement and their prosecutors within that jurisdiction. Again, it could be another country. It could be a, a different state in a different states within the United States. We may receive some feedback from law enforcement if, for instance, they have recovered a child. Um, by virtue of that cyber tip line report. But typically at that point, um, they will do their work and we will turn back to the cyber tip line reports that are coming through. Gotcha. I understand that each case is sensitive and uh, a lot of people would consider heinous, excuse me, heinous when it involves um, a child. And so I'm not asking you to pick what is more serious than, than another particular yeah. case. But when, when you have a case that 
um, alleges that people in positions of power, whether that's government or business or in the community, positions of power are exploiting, exploiting children. Does, does something go off in your brain like we really need to get this person because they are, they are using their power for bad? So I, I, I think like you noted at first, I, you know, we don't, um, you know, we're, we don't really categorize offenders in that way. If it's an individual that is harming a child, then we wanna make sure that child is recovered and receives all the services um, and, and recovery assistance that, that that child can possibly receive. Um, you know, we certainly are aware that individuals who might be in a position of trust or authority, um, that may be a school teacher, that may be somebody who um, ha has a civic role that, that has some level of responsibility, um, that those individuals, you know, sometimes can be in greater positions of power to lure or entice a child um, and, and have more access to children because people might view them as um, being more trustworthy or, you, you know, being more suitable to circulate with children. So, you, you know, we certainly um, are aware that um, individuals who are, again, in positions of trust or authority, maybe to that specific child who's being abused or more generally, um, certainly can be offenders as well. How many people do you have uh, in, in the national office working on these cases at any given time? Oh, um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have the best number for that. Um, I, I think it's about 80 or 100 um, total analysts, and that also includes some individuals who work specifically with survivor services. So they are working with survivors um, after they've been recovered on um, recovery services, therapeutic support, and things of that sort. How how do you and your team handle these tips? help so many survivors hear their stories, have to look at these images to try and track uh, down these victims and, and the perpetrators. How do you go through that every day and keep a level head to want to come back the next day and continue this work? Well, I think the analysts who do this work in the Exploited Children Division are, um, they're amazing individuals. And I think they, they simply have a deep dedication to the mission. I mean, we, we know our mission at NCMEC, no matter what role we're filling within the organization, is to help find missing children, reduce child sexual exploitation, and prevent child victimization. That's our, our mantra, and it's what we live by day by day. Um, there are certainly more difficult days, again, for those analysts who are reviewing content, who are speaking with parents, who are speaking with survivors. But, but I think they just, um, again, they keep our mission statement in mind, and it, it gets them through to the next day. Is there anything else you'd like to add that I didn't touch on? Um, no, I, uh, again, happy to, happy to answer any other questions, but just really um, thank you for highlighting this issue. And thank you so much for your time and, and really helping us to better understand the work that you folks do. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you.